Hello, hello. This video is entitled The Fundamentals of Chest Tube Physiology. This is the first video in a two-part series. In the first video, we'll be talking about chest tube physiology, and in the second video, we'll be talking about chest tube management. My name is Edward Shipper. I'm one of the Surgical Education Fellows at the Goodman Surgical Education Center at Stanford, and our Twitter handle is at GSEC underscore surgery. First, let's review some goals and objectives. The goal of this video is to understand the pathophysiology of diseases of the pleural space requiring chest tube placement and to understand the principles of chest tube physiology. After watching this video, the learner will be able to describe the normal physiology of the pleural space, define pneumothorax, hemothorax, and pleural effusion, describe the pathophysiology of pneumothorax, hemothorax, and pleural effusion, list indications for chest tube placement, and explain how chest tube placement corrects the pathophysiology of these diseases. Before we begin any discussion of chest tubes, it's important to have a basic understanding of the normal physiology of the pleural space. We'll start off by drawing a schematic diagram of the right and left hemithorax. We won't worry about the contents of the mediastinum in this diagram. The pleural space is the area between the visceral pleura, which lines the lung parenchyma, and the parietal pleura, which lines the inner surface of the chest wall. The pleural space is normally a potential space, with lung parenchyma directly APP opposed to the chest wall, separated only by a thin layer of pleural fluid, but I've exaggerated this space here in this conceptual drawing so that it's easier to appreciate. The lung is made of spongy elastic tissue that has a tendency to recoil inwards or collapse towards the lung hilum. By contrast, the chest wall, which consists of the bony rib cage contained within the intercostal muscles, has a tendency to expand outwards. The net effect of these two opposing vectors is to create a negative pressure within the pleural space. This quantity is known as the intrapleural pr pressure. Another important quantity is the alveolar pressure the pressure within the alveoli of the pulmonary parenchyma. The alveolar pressure may be negative during inspiration or positive during expiration, but under normal physiologic conditions, it is always relatively positive compared to the negative intrapleural pressure. The pressure gradient across the alveolar pressure and the intrapleural pressure is known as the transpulmonary pressure. By convention, it is represented mathematically as the difference between alveolar pressure and intrapleural pressure. Remember that systems tend to flow from high pressure to low pressure. Under normal physiologic conditions, the transpulmonary pressure gradient between the relatively high alveolar pressure and the relatively low intrapleural pressure tends to force the lungs outwards in expansion towards the chest wall. This force directly counteracts the previously mentioned collapsing recoil force of pulmonary parenchyma and keeps the lungs fully expanded against the chest wall. The bottom line is that as long as the intrapleural pressure remains negative, the lung will stay expanded. Things start turning south for the lungs when the normal negative intrapleural pressure is disrupted. Here, we will define three conditions that can disrupt the normal negative intrapleural pressure. A pneumothorax is defined as air within the pleural space. Air can be introduced through a defect in the chest wall that connects the outside atmosphere to the pleural cavity or through a defect in the pulmonary parenchyma that connects the alveoli to the pleural cavity. This communication is formally termed an alveolar pleural fistula, but on the wards it is usually referred to as an air leak. More on air leaks in a bit. Causes of pneumothorax are categorized as spontaneous or acquired, but on a general surgery rotation, the pneumothoraces you will see will probably be acquired secondary to trauma. You can imagine a scenario, say, a knife wound through the chest wall or a rib fracture that damages the pulmonary parenchyma, where trauma can cause a pneumothorax. A hemothorax is defined as blood within the pleural cavity. Similarly, the source of blood can come from injury to the chest wall and or the pulmonary parenchyma. Again, on a general surgery rotation, the hemothoraces you will see will probably be acquired secondary to trauma. A pleural effusion is defined as an accumulation of fluid within the pleural space. Some people will consider a hemothorax as a kind of pleural effusion where the type of fluid is blood. 
In practice, most clinicians use the term pleural effusion to describe a buildup of the normal pleural fluid that lubricates the pleural space. There are many causes of pleural effusion, both transudative and exudative, but on a surgery clerkship, and especially on a cardiothoracic surgery rotation, a common scenario you will see is a pleural effusion caused by parenchymal inflammation following cardiac surgery. So why do these conditions compromise respiratory function? In each case, the introduction of air, blood, or fluid into the pleural space disrupts the normal negative intrapleural pressure. A defect in the chest wall, for instance, will allow for the ambient air at relatively positive atmospheric pressure to flow into the relatively negative intrapleural space until the pressure between the atmosphere and pleural space equilibrates, resulting in a positive intrapleural pressure. Similarly, blood or fluid will naturally flow from the site of insult into the pleural space, resulting in a positive intrapleural pressure. A positive intrapleural pressure, in turn, alters the transpulmonary pressure. Remember that under normal conditions, when the intrapleural pressure is negative, the transpulmonary pressure gradient is positive. In practical terms, that means it is directed outwards towards the chest wall from the relatively positive alveolar pressure outwards towards the relatively negative intrapleural pressure, counteracting the natural recoil tendency of the lung and keeping it fully expanded. When air, blood, or fluid enters the pleural space, however, the intrapleural pressure becomes positive and the transpulmonary pressure gradient is eliminated. The transpulmonary pressure is zero, and because the elastic recoil force of the lung is now unopposed, the lung collapses. In case you were wondering, collapsed lungs do not exchange gas very well, resulting in the dyspnea and hypoxemia seen clinically. Any pneumothorax, hemothorax, or pleural fluid collection causing clinical respiratory compromise is an indication for chest tube placement. This is especially true in the trauma setting, where pneumothorax associated with tension physiology or hemothorax causing massive hemorrhage can be immediately life-threatening. Under less dire circumstances, it is possible to observe a small pneumothorax, hemothorax, or pleural effusion visualized with diagnostic imaging, but without associated clinical respiratory compromise. The key to treating these conditions, then, is evacuating the pleural space of air, blood, or fluid, restoring the negative intrapleural pressure of the pleural space in order to drive lung re-expansion, and healing the pulmonary, parenchymal, or chest wall injuries that led to the condition in the first place. A chest tube accomplishes all of these things. Before we tackle how a chest tube works, let's define what a chest tube is. The doctor word for chest tube is tube thoracostomy, but chest tube is the term you'll be using on the wards, so we use that term. Simply stated, a chest tube is a tube that is inserted from the outside environment through the chest wall and into the pleural space, allowing air, blood, or fluid to be drained out of the pleural space. In this video, we will not discuss how to place a chest tube. In effect, the tube creates a communication between the pleural cavity and the outside world. Ideally, we would like for air, blood, or fluid to flow out of the pleural cavity to the outside world. That would allow the lung to re-expand and allow the normal apposition of pulmonary parenchyma and chest wall that is necessary for parenchymal and chest wall injuries to heal. But couldn't the introduction of a tube connected to the outside world just as easily allow air to flow into the pleural space? That sounds like the definition of a pneumothorax to me, which would be counterproductive. So it sounds like there's another piece of equipment we are missing besides the actual tube in the pleural cavity. In order to ensure that air, blood, or fluid preferentially flows out of the pleural space, the chest tube must be connected to some kind of environment where the pressure is relatively low compared to the intrapleural pressure. Remember, systems flow from high to low pressure. By causing matter to flow out of the intrapleural space, the intrapleural pressure once again becomes negative, and the lung is able to re-expand and exchange gas. Can you think of a way to artificially create such an environment? Historically, a three-bottle system was used to create a relatively low-pressure environment within the bottles to facilitate drainage from the pleural space. The system originally started with one water seal bottle partially filled with water. The bottle was closed except for an input channel receiving the chest tube, with one end of the chest tube situated in the patient's pleural cavity and the other end submerged in water, and an output channel to vent the bottle to the outside atmosphere. 
In order to understand how the system would work, it's useful to think of a cup of soda with a lid and a straw, the kind you can buy for a cheap 10 bucks at the movies. Using this analogy, the straw functions like the chest tube. You can move air out of the straw into the soda cup by blowing, it will just bubble out. But you can't move air into the straw. Try and you're liable to get a refreshing mouthful of ice cold Coca-Cola. The same type of phenomenon happens in the water seal bottle. As long as the interpleural pressure is higher than the hydrostatic pressure created by the column of water in the bottle, a level typically maintained at two centimeters of water, then air in the pleural cavity will proceed out of the chest tube, bubble out, and exit the bottle system through the output channel. The presence of water effectively seals off air from entering the chest tube, hence the term water seal. The functional result is a one-way valve system that allows air to leave the pleural space but not to enter it. By removing air from the intrapleural space, a negative intrapleural pressure is restored and the lung is able to re-expand. The water seal bottle works great on its own as long as air is the only substance being evacuated by the pleural space, but problems arise when fluid needs to be evacuated from the pleural cavity as with a hemothorax or pleural effusion. In this scenario, the additional blood or pleural fluid that drains into the water seal bottle causes the volume of the water seal fluid to grow, increasing the hydrostatic pressure imparted by the water seal fluid. If the hydrostatic pressure increases to a point that it equals the intrapleural pressure, then the pressure gradient driving substances out of the pleural cavity is eliminated, and the chest tube will no longer continue to drain. As long as air, blood, or fluid remains in the pleural cavity, there is no negative intrapleural pressure, and the lung will not fully re-expand. To solve this problem, a second bottle, serving as a collection chamber, was added to the system. Here, the chest tube is connected to the input channel of the collection bottle, where it collects any fluid that is drained from the pleural space. The output of the collection bottle is then connected to the input of the water seal bottle. By separating fluid output and air output from the pleural cavity into two bottles, the quantity of fluid used to create the water seal remains constant, and the one-way valve effect afforded by the water seal is preserved. Nevertheless, the water seal system does have its limits. Pleural space evacuation with the water seal system is essentially a passive process, driven primarily by the positive intrapleural pressure associated with the pneumothorax, hemothorax, or pleural effusion. In cases where the output of air, blood, or pleural fluid is significant, however, this passive pressure may not be sufficiently high to completely evacuate the pleural space and re-expand the lung. For this scenario, a third suction bottle was added to the system and connected to an active external source of suction that could achieve the negative pressures of sufficient magnitude needed to completely evacuate the pleural space. In this system, the output of the water seal bottle is connected to the input of the suction bottle, and the output of the suction bottle is connected to an external source of suction. As a safety maneuver to prevent excessive and potentially traumatic suction forces from damaging the lung and chest wall tissue, a stronger water seal channel maintained at 20 centimeters of water is introduced to this bottle. With this modification, if the active external suction force were greater than 20 centimeters of water, air from the atmosphere is able to overcome the hydrostatic force of the water seal, enter the system, and limit the suction force applied to the pleural cavity at 20 centimeters of water. Practically speaking, it is the 20 centimeters of water seal in the suction bottle, not the external suction force, that determines how much suction is applied to the pleural space. Take the time to learn the three-bottle system. Knowing the difference between water seal and suction will go a long way towards your understanding of chest tube management. If you haven't seen a three-bottle system in the hospital, it's because we don't use them anymore. Every new bottle requires connecting new tubes, and every tube connection creates an additional opportunity for air from the outside to enter the closed system and disrupt the function of the chest tube. Today's chest tube management devices combine all the elements of the traditional three-bottle system into a single apparatus. This is a picture of an Atrium brand Plurivac system, one of the commonly used chest tube management systems seen on the wards. Let's take a minute to deconstruct this system into its three component chambers. The schematic diagram you see on the right has the front face of the Plurivac system removed so you can appreciate the different partitions. 
The tube connected to the top right corner of the box is connected to the patient's pleural cavity. Air, blood, or pleural fluid from the patient's pleural cavity drains first into the collection chamber, represented in the photo by the three windows with number markings. The collection chamber is divided such that blood or fluid collects first in the rightmost window before overflowing in a leftward direction. The numbers along the window represent the volume in milliliters and allow the clinician to quantify the amount of blood or fluid drained from the pleural space. After blood or fluid is deposited in the collection chamber, air travels leftward along the top of the system and then down into the water seal chamber, which is hidden in the photo behind the black paneling. The actual water creating the water seal is visible in the photo in the window marked C. Look closely and you can see that this water seal is maintained at two centimeters of water, just like our three bottle system. Air bubbling out of the water seal enters the suction chamber seen in the photo as the staggered white column marked B. The external suction channel exits at the top left of the system seen in the photo as a blue cylinder above the words atrium. Note that this particular system is not hooked up to external suction. The protective water seal for the suction chamber is also hidden behind the black paneling on the left of the device, but you can see that the magnitude of the water seal can be set using the meter marked A in the photo. As with the three bottle system, the default setting is 20 centimeters of water. The actual negative pressure transmitted to the patient's pleural cavity can be observed empirically using the markings along the column marked B. Combining all three chambers into a single system without numerous tubing connections helps keep the system closed by reducing the number of opportunities for external air to enter the system. This is also a good time to reiterate that a chest tube really isn't complete without a chest tube management system. Recreating the three bottle system with the chest tube management device is critical for evacuating the pleural space of air, blood, or fluid, restoring the negative intrapleural pressure of the pleural space in order to drive lung re-expansion, and allowing the pulmonary parenchyma to oppose to the chest wall, seal off and heal the injuries, and prevent recurrence of disease. And that concludes our video on the fundamentals of chest tube physiology. In the second video of this series, we'll be discussing the fundamentals of chest tube management.